This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone. Presented by Ventures Fly Company. Hey everybody, welcome to it. This is Untangled and I am your host, Spencer Durant. I got one really important question as we start the show today. Is winter ever going to end? (laughs) There's more winter storm warnings this week here in Wyoming. I know back in Utah, there's winter storm warnings. It just seems like this is the winter that is never going to quit. Uh, No matter what we do, it's just going to keep snowing. I I bet we're going to see snow come June, uh, July, August. I mean, that's kind of normal for Wyoming, but I bet other places in the West are going to see freak storms like that. It's just, it's nuts this year, but that's neither here nor there. The fishing is starting to warm up, even if the weather isn't. And speaking of fishing, really, really hope that y'all enjoyed episode 16, the big one, as much as I did. It was a lot of fun to have the whole group together. And we are planning on doing stuff similar to that uh, here in the future. I know Alex is going to come on the show on a more regular basis here. We're going to talk shop about all sorts of different uh, topics when Alex is in the house. Uh, Bertrand, I don't know that he's going to, uh, do a whole lot. He, he says that his calling is not in the podcast world, but I, I got a bone to pick with that. I, I think Bertrand could be a great podcast, uh, personality if he would just, uh, apply himself <laughs> a little bit more. But anyways, we've got a wonderful, wonderful show lined up for you today. I'm actually really excited about this one. We're going to be talking sink tip fly lines woolly buggers and leeches, the best rods to use for nymphs, streamers, and dry flies. So really, you know, buckle up because this is going to be a lot of fun. And real quick, though, before we do jump in, a reminder about uh, questions. If you've got a question that you would like answered on the show, please shoot us that question. All right. There's always a link in the podcast description. Uh, We send a link out in our weekly emails every week. You can get to us by a whole variety of methods uh, to get a hold of us for the show. So please do it. I love hearing from everybody. Uh, I've had the chance to connect with a few podcast listeners the last week or so. It's been a ton of fun, and that's what this stuff's all about, right? So if you got questions about fly fishing that you need answered, please shoot them our way. Now, I do need to start the show with a very important comment. Tommy from Collettesville, hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, Collettesville, North Carolina, his uh, his question of the show was not a question. It was a statement. Two words, Coke Zero, <laughs> in reference to the debate in episode 16. Would you rather have Diet Coke or Coke Zero? So I think I'm going to have to do a little bit of a poll. Uh, wherever you're listening to this, uh, get on to social media. Tag Ventures of Flyco, Coke Zero or Diet Coke. Which one? And if you don't like either of those ones, I know we had some other listeners write in and say that there are better soft drinks to uh, drink while you're tying flies or whatever it is that you're doing. So (laughs) I'd love to hear what you guys have to say about that. Uh, Now, we are going to start the show off today with a question from Marvin from Missouri. This one is uh, about sink tip fly lines here. So Marvin says, Love your podcast. I don't live near trout streams, but love catching bluegill, bass, crappie, and even an occasional catfish. I primarily fish ponds and lakes. My question is sink tip fly lines. I seem to have gotten myself really confused as what would best fit my needs. I can get the flies out there, but I'm thinking that a little more subsurface would help. Thanks. Again, that's Marvin from Missouri. Marvin, that's a really good question. And uh, I remember getting very confused about sinking fly lines when I started fly fishing too. Uh, in fact, I even went so far as to try to make my own sink tip fly lines. And it actually saved my bacon once because I was out on a float tube on a lake on a mountain in central Utah. And there's a lot of big brook trout down there on this mountain. And I was float tubing. And we were actually on a lake that's got big tigers and cutthroat and splake in it. So that's what we were going for that day. But I'm out there with my buddy Mises Mike, and we're float tubing, we're kicking around. I got the fins on the wading boots, you know, whole nine yards, the whole get up, and I'm kicking around, and I've got my floating fly line, and then I just did a perfection loop at the end of some sinking line. I, I just bought like a super cheap sinking line from the store, 
and I cut it up into like 15 foot lengths so I could make my own sink tips. And I, uh, I attached it via perfection loop to the floating fly line. And then I had it, uh, you know, run in the water. So I was kind of trailing some streamers behind the boat. And then all of a sudden I feel this weird, like snap against my foot. I trying to figure out what's going on. So I look down and the fin, the strap on the back of the float tube fin had snapped and my float tube fin was starting to sink. And I don't know how I got lucky. I grabbed it before it sank, but all of a sudden I'm out there in the middle of this lake and it's a sizable lake, right? Like I wouldn't, I couldn't swim across it. Okay. And I granted, I can't swim super well, but you know, it, it's one of those lakes where it would be really tough to kind of swim across it. It's just big enough. It's cold. It's really deep. And I'm kind of freaking out because I've got one float tube fin. And so I'm kicking with the one fin, but I'm just going in circles here. I'm just, I'm having a moment on this lake. And then I had the bright idea of like, well, what if I reattach the strap on the float tube fin with the sink tip fly line that I had? Mm-hmm. So I unattached the sink tip fly line and uh, Jerry rigged the float tube fin back around the boot and I was able to kick myself back into shore that way. So it literally did save my bacon. The fact that I had a sink tip fly line that I'd made myself. Uh, but that being said, I do not recommend using those that you make yourself because they don't cast very well at all. Uh, it wasn't tapered. All right. That homemade sink tip line wasn't tapered. So it never cast right. Uh, it, but I, I had to share that story, Marvin. So thanks for, uh, thanks for bringing that to to my memory again because that, that was a fun it was a fun day. I caught some fish that day. But uh, if you're on ponds or lakes and you're primarily fishing for bluegill, bass, and crappie, you probably want a sink tip for those bass and the occasional catfish that you mentioned. Those are the two species that stand out to me as stuff that you would actually need a sink tip for. Now, the late, great Dave Whitlock, he wrote a fantastic piece about how he fished for sunfish, bluegill in particular, over in Fly Fisherman Magazine, and I'm going to link that in the podcast description. But from Dave's telling of it, he always used floating fly lines and just lengthened his leader if he needed to get to those sunfish. So that'd be your bluegill and your crappie, right? Uh and then with the bass and the occasional catfish, obviously it's going to be a, a different setup for those. Now, I'm admittedly not a sunfish expert. I live in Wyoming. After all, we're not swimming in them out here. Uh, but I would probably stay away from sink tip lines for bluegill and other sunfishes. I don't know anybody that fishes them that way. Now, if you do, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, but in my asking questions and perusing the interwebs to help answer this question for you, Marvin, it seems like most folks who are fishing for those fish are doing it with floating fly lines and just longer leaders. So especially because the sunfish tend to be a little bit on the smaller side, you're using lighter rods that sink tip is so heavy. It can be kind of hard to feel the takes sometimes with a sink tip fly line. Now on some of my own trips to Lake Powell in Southern Utah, you know, I fished floating fly lines all day for smallmouth bass, and we even caught some walleye off floating fly lines. Uh, now, that's probably a completely different bass environment than what you have in Missouri, so take that for what it's worth as well. The thing to, with sink tip fly lines, though, is that they are they're usually meant to kind of be fished on moving water. The tip sinks, obviously. <laughs> that's, that's the name of the fly line, but the rest of it floats so that you can still make mends and adjust your drift as you swing streamers through likely hidey holes of trout. That's why we have these sink tip fly lines. That said, if you're just trying to get your fly lines down, like kind of midway through the water column in a lake, a sink tip could work really well for that. But one thing to note is that the sink tip can pull that fly line through the water at kind of a, kind of an odd angle, as opposed to keeping it flat and at relatively the same depth that you would get if you were fishing a full sink fly line. A full sink fly line is pretty self-explanatory, but they are mostly used just for getting those bigger flies out a lot further and for getting them really deep. So those bass and catfish that you mentioned, if they are hanging uh, deep around a lot of submerged structure in your lakes, deeper than you can really get with a sink tip in your leader, 
then it makes sense to use a full sync line in those situations. Orvis actually is a great resource on sync tip and full sync lines. I'm going to link in the podcast description as well. I think this will help uh, clear up any lingering confusion that you might have, Marvin. Now, from the sounds of it, I think what I would recommend for you to do is get both a sync tip and a full sync line for your fishing. Sync tip's probably going to be the most versatile. You can use it in a lot of different situations, uh, but you could always use that full sync line also to help you get down to where those bigger bass and catfish are holding as well. And I just want to reiterate, definitely read through Dave Whitlock's article on fishing for panfish. Dave knew his stuff. Uh, the man was just brilliant. Can't say enough good stuff. I never met Dave, unfortunately, but he's influenced me and every other fly fisher who's fishing right now. Dave was just monumental in the sport. And unfortunately, we did lose him earlier this year. Uh, but wonderful guy. Tons of fantastic information. So make sure you read through that article of his. So thank you, Marvin, for the question. A uh, really good one. Next question is Wyatt from Wyoming. Wyatt says, Spencer, I look forward to my Wednesday drive to work just to hear your podcast. Oh, shucks. Wyatt, you're going to make me blush. <laughs> no, seriously, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, it has helped me to survive this cursed winter. Anyway, I've lived in Wyoming all of my life and only got into fly fishing a few seasons ago. I really got into fly tying when I moved up to the northern part of the state and was able to pick up a rod more and more. One question still bugs me when I'm filling my boxes. What's the difference between a bugger and a leech? Thanks for your help. Tight lines. Wyatt, howdy. It is wonderful. Here from a fellow Wyomingite. And, you know, like, so I was, I'm from Utah, right? And so we're Utahns. Uh, in that, that's how we're, well, that's how we refer to ourselves. Other people have derogatory terms for us that, uh, you know, I'm not going to share on the podcast, but you can Google them. Uh, but Wyoming, it's always struck me as one of those, like, man, can't we come up with something better here in Wyoming instead of Wyoming, like Wyoming in that nah, doesn't work either. If you have any ideas, drop them, uh, it, it comments, uh, throw throw something at me on social media. I'm curious if we've got a better word for uh, than Wyomingite because it just doesn't really roll off the tongue. Anyways, uh, yes, Wyatt, it's great to hear from you. And this winter has been brutal. I am so ready for the weather to warm up enough that I can fish somewhere other than the river through town an hour away from me. That's really the only place that's been open the last couple of months. Now, getting to your question, this is actually a really good question, and it doesn't have like the simple answer (laughs) that you would probably like. Now that's a lot of things in fly fishing, right? It's not always a simple answer. That's just kind of the way uh, the fly fishing goes. Now, the way that I've always understood your question, what's the difference between a bugger and a leech is this woolly buggers are our do all imitation fly. They can be a bait fish, a crawfish, a giant nymph, a sculpin, and yes, even a leech. They are kind of your jack of all trades. They're like the atoms of the streamer family, right? The atoms works in mayfly hatches and caddis hatches. Uh, I've had fish take them in stonefly hatches before. I don't know why I had an atoms on when the stoneflies were out, but you know, the atoms is kind of your do all bug uh, for dry flies. Very similar situation you find yourself in with woolly bugger. Uh, it is your do all bug for streamers. Now, uh, you can think of it like all buggers are leeches, but not all leeches are buggers. And, you know, it's one of them uh, like mind twister (laughs) statements you got to figure out. But just like all those other bugs I mentioned, though, right? A leech is a specific species. So your woolly bugger can imitate a ton of different food sources as one really handy pattern. A leech pattern, on the other hand, is tied specifically to imitate that particular bug. So just like how a woolly bugger can imitate a crawfish, but we have a ton of crawfish specific fly patterns out there, right? Our woolly bugger doubles as crawfish, but we've got all these extra crawfish specific fly patterns out there. Think of it. Think of the difference between woolly buggers and leeches that same way. Your leech, your woolly bugger can double for a bunch of leeches, but we have specific leech patterns. I've got a few that are kind of my go-to on these high country lakes around here and back in Utah because they really imitate the kind of tiny little leeches that you see in the water. 
uh, and they're a lot smaller than a typical wooly bugger pattern. So that's why I'll use them and that's why I'll tie them. So I guess the rule of thumb here is to try and match what's in your box to what you really need. Hopefully that clears up your question there. Why it's a good question. Your leeches are specifically tied to be like the actual leech, whereas the wooly bugger can be a whole host of different uh, aquatic food sources for trout. So thank you for the question. Really, really appreciate it. So I got married right in the middle of the pandemic, and that actually turned out to be a fantastic uh, decision on my part and my wife's because we didn't get invited to a lot of family things because we weren't having a whole lot of family things. And so we're both kind of homebodies. We got to just sit around and do a whole lot of nothing. But now that the pandemic's, you know, fully over and we're all kind of back into the swing of things, we're getting invited to these family parties more and more. And I was thinking the other day, man, if I didn't have fly fishing to talk about at these parties, I would have nothing to talk about at these family get togethers. So I'm sure you probably feel the same way. Now, you would like to have more ammunition for something to talk about. And let's be honest, not everybody wants to hear about fly fishing. So if they know that you know, you're going to be talking fly fishing the whole time. They might, you might get even lucky enough that they won't invite you. All right. So you don't have to go to the get togethers anymore. You know, there's that option there if you, if you get so lucky. But if you want to know more about fly fishing, you know, so you really impress folks at these get togethers or weasel your way out of them, submit your questions about fly fishing through the Untangled podcast. This is where we can answer them. I'll give you that information you need to grease the wheels in whatever direction you choose at your get-togethers this year. So, throw your questions our way. All right, just like that, our uh, time together is rapidly coming to a close. This is the last question of the show. It comes to us from Tennessee. Josh, are are you a 10? Because you're the only 10 I see. (laughs) Oh, I'm sorry. I uh, I love really bad pickup lines, and I, my day job is teaching high school, so I, I I get the chance to just watch the kids groan. They almost hate the pickup lines as much as they hate the dad jokes that I'll tell. Uh, but it's fun to just you know throw a couple of those really bad ones out at them and just just watch the kids just go, "Oh, Durant, come on again." So you know, I'll, I'll, one of my personal favorites is a. Uh, if you were a burger at McDonald's, you'd be the McGorgeous. <laughs> They're just so terrible, but you can't just help but laugh at them. At least I can't. I, maybe maybe I'm the only one who's entertained by them. Anyway, let's let's get back to fly fishing and Josh from Tennessee. Let's get back to your question. Uh, Josh asks, do I need different rods for the different flies I'm throwing, like streamers, dries, and nymphs? Also, I've been trying to get into dry fly fishing, and I just wanted to know what the best line and weight pole is best for that. Thank you all so much. Also, love the jokes in the last video. Well, Josh, you're welcome. You know, we we try with the jokes. <laughs> I'm assuming you mean my jokes, too, and not Bertrand's. Or did Alex even tell a, a, tell a joke? I, I'm trying to... No, no, Alex told... Alex had to have told a joke, right? Right? Uh, yeah, he, you know, I, we're going to just pretend it, Josh is thanking me for my jokes. <laughs> oh, uh, Josh, in all seriousness, though, this is a great question. I think one a lot of beginners have. I'm going to answer the first part of your question first for you. So among other reasons, I'm not going to get into all of them here, but the reason that some top end fly rods are you know more than a thousand dollars right now is because they really can do just about everything you need in the nine foot five weight category. And that's kind of why the nine foot five weight is such a popular rod. It is the 30 out six of fly fishing, right? I, I hunt a uh, big game as well. And so here's your hunting metaphor for those of you who hunt as well as fly fish. You can hunt antelope, deer, and elk with a 30 out six. I even know some folks who shot moose with a 30 out six. I don't know that I would, but you know, some folks have done it. So that same idea of like the 30 out six just does everything you need. That same idea applies to our nine foot five weight fly rods. You can use a good nine foot five weight to fish most dry fly streamers and nymphs. And it's going to do all of those things 
really, really well. Right. It's going to just kind of knock all of those items out of the park, all of those, uh, all of those fishing instances out of the park. So as far as dries and nymphs go, unless you decide to Euro nymph, which is completely fine. I'm not throwing any shade at Euro nymphing here at all. But unless you decide that you want a Euro nymph, you don't need a dedicated nymphing rod and then a dedicated dry fly rod. All right, your nymphing rods, your fly rod is going to work well for nymphs and dries. Just by virtue of how they're built these days, the tapers, the actions, they are, they're designed, especially in the nine foot five weight category, they're designed to do both of those things exceptionally well. So uh, you don't need to worry about getting a separate rod just for your dry fly fishing and a separate rod just for your nymph fishing, right? These rods should have a nice soft tip that's sensitive, but a, a pretty stout midsection and butt section that's going to handle longer casts or muscling bigger fish away from snags and into the net. You want that in both your dry fly and your nymphing rods. Now, some dry fly centered rods, like the Sage Trout LL, for example, they may not be as great for nymphing because they might not mend as well compared to like a faster action rod like our fly flinger here at vfc i even have some four weights they are wonderful dry fly rods but they don't nip very well because they don't have the backbone that a five weight would have to mend over really long big and complex currents so that's usually only a consideration that like you're only going to run into this issue where your rod's not going to do everything you need it to in the nymph game if you bought a rod that's like a specific softer dry fly rod, by softer I mean like softer action, so usually a little bit slower, not as stiff of a rod either. And usually that's only going to be a consideration if you bought that dry fly rod and it's not a five weight. Almost every five weight that I've fished, and I've fished a lot of fly rods, almost every five weight is going to do a really good job of casting dries and mending while nymphing. That is where the five weight excels that's where this rod shines it's just that's what they're built to do and that's why some of them cost so much because they do both things so well there's other factors that go into it into the high cost as well uh but where it makes sense to me to have a second rod is for fishing your streamers especially if you really get into it and you want to start throwing sink tip lines and throw larger streamer patterns for the bigger trout that are in the rivers uh, in those cases, I'd recommend a six weight or even a seven weight. In some cases, it really just depends on the size of river uh, and the size of streamer that you're going to be throwing. Uh, the six weight is great for streamers just because it has extra backbone and power to not only cast you or heavier streamers, but the heavier sink tip fly lines as well. So in a longer, more roundabout answer to your question here, Josh, if you plan on only fishing streamers when the situation calls for it, like you're out and you need to throw like a size 10 or even like a size eight woolly bugger, your nine foot five weight's gonna gonna handle that. And your nine foot five weight's gonna be great for nymphs and dries on top of that. But if you want to dedicate yourself to the streamer game, six weight's gonna be your best friend. Now, if we look at the dry fly side of this argument, I do a lot of my dry fly fishing with bamboo rods these days uh, when I can. I really, really like fishing the soft, slow rods for dry flies. Not everybody feels that way, which is completely fine. And certainly a lot of people probably aren't going to agree with my love of bamboo fly rods, which is fine. But unless you're, unless you're trying to go for that specific feel or you're trying to fish like really tiny bugs a lot of the time, you aren't going to need a specialized dry fly rod to have you're not you're you're not going to need that specialized dry fly rod because your nine foot five weight is going to be able to handle a huge like 90 probably close to 90 percent of your dry fly fishing needs your nine foot five weight is going to be able to handle just fine it's that last 10 percent that sometimes it's nice to have a different rod but you can still make it work with that nine foot five weight so long as you know what you're trying to do, right? Like a really nice eight and a half foot four weight uh, can really help with those really delicate presentations, but that's not a necessary rod to have. If we're, if we're just trying to, you know, consolidate costs and really 
do our best here with what we've got, then uh, your nine foot five weight is going to handle so much of what you need to do that unless you were really just burning to get more rods and you know, I have three dozen fly rods. So I'm probably not the guy to ask about this because I'll always tell you buy another rod. Uh, but unless you're doing something that's very technique specific, that nine foot five weight's going to cover you. Hopefully that question makes sense. I know I meandered a little bit there, but hopefully what I was, uh, the feedback I was trying to give you, hopefully that landed somewhere, Josh. If it didn't, let me know and I'll, I'll try and clarify for you. And just like that, folks, that is the end of the show. So thank you to everybody who listens. We really appreciate the engagement that we get off the show. Uh, it's just been a ton of fun to see and to experience this stuff. So uh, one last reminder for questions as well. If you've got any questions about fly fishing and you want them answered, please submit them to the podcast. That's what keeps this engine running here at the show. That's how I'm able to keep putting out a new episode for y'all every single week. And in the meantime, try not to freeze to death. Uh, let's all hope that winter eventually gives up its grip and we can go fishing again and not be swept away by floodwaters. Uh, but we're all really grateful, I know, for the uh, for the added moisture that, uh, that we're getting everywhere and bringing a lot of the West out of some serious drought conditions. Got a long ways to go, but this winter certainly helped in a lot of places. So anyways, I'll shut up about water and you guys have a great time. And until next week, tight lines, everybody.